All right. Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about climate change in the Middle East and North Africa. As a means of introduction, my name is Will Christou and I'm the New Arabs Levantine correspondent here in Beirut. This webinar is part of the New Arabs webinar series, which highlights key issues afflicting the MENA region and its diaspora communities. The New Arab is a progressive and diverse London-based news organization covering the MENA region with a focus on human rights, social, economic justice, and global issues like climate change that affect us all. Today's discussion is fairly topical, given that uh, the UN uh, is having a big meeting in Glasgow and seems to be about half the world's leader there right now. Um, and in general, climate change is a critical issue for the entire world. However, for the MENA uh, region, it's especially critical. The Middle East and North Africa is gonna be one of the hardest hit areas in the world when it comes to climate change. From lasting droughts to unbearable heat, MENA is gonna see climate change um, in real time. Uh, but that's not my job. That's the three wonderful speakers we have today's job to tell us about that. Um, just a quick logistical note, uh, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes and then open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions you'd like answered, uh, go to the little Q&A button down there, type them up, we'll read them and hopefully answer them. Um, but let me introduce the speakers. So Dr. Lauren A. Lambert is an assistant professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies in Qatar and at Sciences Po Paris. He's been working on the water, energy, climate nexus in the Middle East and Africa over the past 16 years. He's a former representative of the global research community at the UN and a board member of the United Nations Climate Technology Center and Network. Leah Kai is the manager of UNDP's climate change projects at the Ministry of Environment, where she works closely with the Lebanese government on designing and implementing sectoral climate policies and promoting policy reforms. Through providing strategic support, she guided the development and implementation of various programs, laws, and regulations in Lebanon. Last but not least, Lina Yassin is a climate activist and journalist from Sudan. She's been covering climate change issues since she was 17, uh, 18. Uh, she's currently the operations manager at Climate Tracker, an international nonprofit organization aiming to support, train, and incentivize better climate journalism globally. Lauren, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to give us, you know, sort of an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about climate change in the Middle East and North Africa. Specifically, if you could tell us about the general situation in MENA, you know, are countries really at risk, and if so, what risks are we talking about, and how are they going about addressing these risks? You know, are, are they being proactive? Are they letting it happen? Mm, thank you. That's a broad question, Will, but that's a very good question. Basically, what are the key risks for the MENA region? So if you don't mind, I will share a few slides to help, you know, navigate this um, broad question and to share some thoughts on it, largely based on what the um, the IPCC, so the International Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations has shared with the global community a few months ago. This is a face of climate change in the MENA region. A few weeks ago, we had Cyclone Shaheen, which devastated some fair swath of Oman, then went up to the border with the UAE, and finally made some damage in Iran. And what may seem to be something we've seen for decades or even more than centuries is actually something fairly new. First, the scope. I mean, I would like on this picture to let you know that this is a huge cyclone. Now, this is a cyclone that which, which went to places where we were not expecting them to go. This is one of the few cyclones in recent years that has made more damage on the path that we were thinking in the North Indian Ocean, close to the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Aden, where we're not thinking they would go. So we have stories of devastation with regards to climate change, which are, of course, in the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, and in Somalia, et cetera. This is one of the faces of climate change. But of course, this is one of the many facets of the issue. So I wanted to start with this picture of a very recent phenomenon, which, of course, has created a lot of problems with it. And probably billions, we are still counting for it. I mean, the Omani authorities are still counting the cost, but it probably has generated billions in damage. And of course, the loss of life is something we cannot count in monetary terms, but all of that shows how serious climate change has become in this region. 
But let me start by saying just a few words when we speak about climate change, what, is about, what it is about. We know the world has been warmed up by the sun for millions of years. But the problem is that with an increasing amount of pollution, we've made some sun radiation not bounce back as it used to towards outer space. So in other words, we are in a system which is keeping the warmth coming from the sun. And what used to be a nice balance is becoming unbalanced. And we have an increasing amount of heat in our climate system. And this affects many things. The first, of course, mean temperatures, the temperatures around the world. And we can see that because of this pollution, largely carbon pollution, so CO2, carbon dioxide pollution, essentially, do not only. We have, the more we've had these carbon pollution, largely due to the industrial revolution, and then, you know, development of consumption of oil and gas, but first and foremost, coal, we've had an increase in temperature. And this increase in temperature has been growing. And this was a few years ago, five years ago, but since then, the temperature has not been uh, plateauing. It's been increasing and actually increasing faster. We've been measuring it through various ways. So now there is a real scientific consensus, be it analyzing uh, ice sheets or analyzing corals or uh, trees, the way they grow, we've been seeing climate change affecting nature and how it has been accelerating in recent years. What is important is that in the recent report from the IPCC, we can see this brownish, um, you know, a cloud of points and curve and it's growing. This is the increase in temperature in recent decade. And we can see how different it is from what would just happen if only nature was happening. Because, you know, there are some, what some, you know, solar eruptions. Sometimes the sun is more active. Sometimes we have volcanoes, right? This has been ongoing for millions of years, but we can distinguish clearly between the two. And there is no doubt now that the amount, the extraordinary amount of pollution has been increasing our climate system, the, the heat trapped in our climate system. But most of it actually has gone into oceans. And it's important to keep that in mind because we're not talking about a small amount. The majority of the heat has gone into the oceans. So oceans have been heating up. And as you may see in, these, in this map, um, what has been warming up more has been the regions around the, the equator and the tropics, and especially close to developing countries or regions of developing countries, such as Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia and Southeast Asia. These are regions where water have increased in temperature. But overall, across the planet, and except for very small places, the global ocean, as we call it, has been warming. But of course, it's also what we call the cryosphere. So the glaciers, the Arctic, which have been melting, as we can see with this dramatic picture of a change over a few decades, because, you know, 60 years for something which has been created over millions and millions of years is, is just a very short period. But we have all across the world, these pictures of before and after, if you want, of how climate change is really affecting our environments. And of course, both this increase in the heat of the global temperatures, including the oceans, first and foremost, the oceans, but also the melting of the cryosphere. Again, these glaciers, the Arctic, Greenland, all of that contributes to the level of the sea gradually rising. Oh, it's not huge. It's just a few millimeters per year. But the problem is keeping growing. You know, it just keeps on growing. So we have an issue that over time, we have areas of the world, again, and especially around, you know, the tropics and the equator, which might be affected by coastal flooding. And I like these statistics because they put things in perspective. The amount of coastal flooding has been increasing dramatically in recent decades. If that means that, right. yes, uh, I'm just me. okay, yeah, and and don't worry, I won't be long. I'm almost done. 
the amount of coastal flooding has been dramatically increasing. And where it's important is that for a region such as the Middle East and North Africa region, this is where most coastal, most big cities are. Cities such as Rabat in Morocco to the Gulf State cities are all coastal cities. Cairo and Alexandria are close to the sea. Beirut, um, Tripoli, Algiers, you name it. Most large Arab cities are close to the sea. So this issue is increasing and the coastal floodings, last but not least, might be devastating if we have, as we've seen at the beginning, also at the same time that we have this uh, increase of the level of the sea, we have these huge um, storms that happen and which can devastate uh, cities such as, as in Oman, the UAE and Iran, as we've seen at the beginning. I'm done with it, but I just wanted to share some slides that can give an idea of how fast things are changing. So thank you for that introduction. It's super helpful and give us a good basis for what we're about to talk about. Uh, Leah, now I'm going to move on to you. Um, and I'm going to ask you to zoom in a little bit because you know your expertise, a lot of it has to do with Lebanon. Um, Lebanon, as we know, has been going through a pretty tough time for the last two years, protracted economic and political crisis. And yet, unlike other countries in the region who have more resources than the political wherewithal, uh, it's put something together of a climate change policy. So could you tell us uh, a little bit about its climate change policy and how Lebanon has managed to keep climate change on the agenda in spite of the deterioration of the state? Thank you, Will. Um, yes, we can't really hide it from, from the rest of the world. Uh, currently, Lebanon is, uh, is passing, I think, through its, its worst crisis in history. Um, four crises in the same time uh, uh, that we have to deal with as, as, as a government, as a society. Um, the COVID, the economic crisis, but also the Beirut blast and uh, uh, the influx of Syrian refugees that started in 2011 and that it's still very um, um, visible and very heavy um, in Lebanon that is putting a lot of pressure of what we of, um, of, of the resources that we that we already have. So, um, but um, uh, we have started to work on climate change not now a long time ago, and I think we knew that eventually this would come that we have to be ready for when the momentum would come. So um, we have always been proactive in climate change, whether it's at the international scene and colleagues and participants that follow on negotiations know that Lebanon is a very active small country um, 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 in negotiations, but also at the national level where we guide the climate change agenda and we mainstream climate change in a lot of the recent um, um, sectoral policies. Um, and we started our involvement back, I think, in 2007, so with the Valley uh, uh, Roadmap and then with Copenhagen, because um, um, we knew that climate change was going to gain momentum, and we wanted really to distinguish ourselves from other developing countries, especially in the MENA, because we know that we are different. We have different, we are not an oil producing country. We have a different narrative, a different, uh, um, different political system, different social structures. So we knew that we really have to be ready and to tailor um, the story of climate change to um, our life and our society. And actually, um, um, we wanted to prepare to ourselves to what was coming. And indeed, we are living today what we and the world predicted uh, back in the 90s. So we are living increases in temperature. We are living changes in rain patterns, in seasons, the increased frequency of extreme events and um, climate disasters. And, and, and we are really living and paying the price of, this, of these cumulative impacts um, um, on our social, economic, and environmental systems. So um, in the same time, we knew, we've always known that we need to move away from fossil fuel. We are an economy that is very vulnerable um, to fossil fuel imports. And we knew that eventually we need to invest more in renewable energy, not only from an environmental point of view, but, um, but also as an opportunity to gain energy security slash political security to reduce our energy bill and budget deficit and to optimize the use of our resources. So actually, well, when the Paris Agreement came, came in, 20, in 2015, we were ready. 
we were really ready to put on the table concrete plans with emission targets, with renewable energy targets, with very clear financial needs, technical needs, and capacity building. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna push you a little bit here. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you say mainstreaming climate change in policies? Um, yes. Yes, so, so the idea, uh, you know, in our part of the world, if you go, you knock the door of a minister and you say, you know what, we're going to talk about climate change, what we're going to do, they're going to shut the door at your nose. So the whole idea is to very smoothly and swiftly integrate climate change concept in plans that other ministries are already doing. They are not claiming that we are uh, we are drafting the energy policy of the country or the agricultural policy of the country. But what I can ensure you is that we are everywhere, <laughs> literally. So we know what happens when, who's preparing what. We make sure that we are there on the right table with the right stakeholders. And we make sure that climate change concepts are taken into account. For example, renewable energy, we push the target. In 2015, it was 20% renewable energy. We worked hardly with the Ministry of Energy and Water and provided concrete examples that yes, we can, we can increase it to 30% in our 2020 updated nationally determined contribution has a 30% renewable energy target. Uh, for example, with the Ministry of Agriculture, they were doing this whole strategy for the sector and not only for the ministry. And we, were, uh, we, we, we made sure that we are there to take into account the effect of climate change on irrigation, on irrigation needs, the types of crops that are vulnerable um, um, to climatic changes in the Bekaa Valley. The same for water, big infrastructure water project. Take into account that we have flash floods, we have rain. So do not design an, an infrastructure drainage system uh, just based on an average uh, water, uh, uh, rainwater or precipitation, it has to take into account these flash floods that our cities are facing the last 10 years where suddenly you get a whole month of rain in two days. So this is how very swiftly we have been able uh, to pass whether it's uh, whether it's tax incentives also. In 2018, I think we're one of the few countries uh, maybe after Jordan that, that, that uh, and, and you know, we have a big deficit. Um, in, in Lebanon, we were able to pass a tax incentive for hybrid and electric cars in Lebanon. And it had really pushed the market of, uh, um, of hybrid cars, at least in Lebanon for the last three years. <clears throat> so, so this is, uh, I think, an indirect way to um, mainstream or integrate climate change in plans that are, are already going through. Okay, awesome. That's really informative. So essentially making sure that climate change is always part of the discussion, no matter the project, no matter the ministry. Okay. And, by, and, and by the way, uh, well, recently with UNDP, we have prepared a study to climate proof. So now you have two terms to learn, climate mainstreaming and climate proofing. So we are also integrating climate proofing in the economic vision of Lebanon in this recovery uh, period. Um, where we took uh, all the, uh, you know, the McKinsey economic vision, the um, uh, financial recovery plan, but also the capital investment plan of that. We took the projects and we just put a climate change lens. And we went to the government and said, so you know what? All the projects that you are uh, um, selling or presenting to donors, if you just add a climate change um, um a climate change lens to it, for every one additional dollar that you will call for or that you will invest, you will gain back an economic benefit $3.2. And we did this across the vision, across the project in every separate project. And you have a road. So this road today, the road design and plan is like this. We are proposing it to be like this, to take into account climate change, alternative mobility, whatever. This is how much financial needs you want, but guess what? you will gain it economically uh, three times more uh, um, um, in 20 or 30 years. And we hope that this will be captured in the next period in Lebanon uh, um, during the recovery, um, the recovery and reconstruction period. Fascinating. And I'm sure that's going to be uh, pretty relevant with, with all the rebuilding that Lebanon needs to do over these next few years. Thank you, Leah. Um, I'm going to turn now to Lena. 
Uh, Lena, you're a fellow media practitioner, welcome. Um, and you've been covering climate issues since you were just 18. Um, and now you're training folks on how to better cover environmental issues. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, as a media practitioner, can you tell us a little bit more about the role of media and keeping climate change issues on the agenda and how journalists can integrate climate into the reporting on the MENA? Thank you so much, Joel. Um, I think um, the role that media plays in when it comes to climate change is quite critical because we are essentially the bridge between the presentation that uh, Lauren just gave about how climate change impacts the region and between the general public that does, doesn't usually in their daily life get access to such information, but these information are really critical for them to understand what climate change is, but also more importantly, understand how it, it relates to their daily life. In our vision and throughout my work with Climate Tracker, we've realized that when you speak to a journalist about climate change, they always just think about a niche journalism um, piece that is only about the environment that probably no one is going to read and that probably their editor is going to reject. So even when we try to, during our capacity building programs, when we try to convince journalists in the MENA region to apply for our workshops, they would usually be concerned because they don't understand that climate change is, uh, they understand that climate change is a separate topic, and their main concern is that the editors won't accept the, their articles because no one wants to read about climate change or the environment. One, everyone wants to read about politics, about business. And so I think if we are talking about how we can integrate climate change, this, the, my answer is going to be very similar to what Leah said. We don't have to write about climate change as a separate topic because it's not a separate topic. It's a cross-cutting issue that impacts all aspects of our lives. And therefore, I am one of the people who think that it is the way we shouldn't call we shouldn't have a section called climate journalism. We shouldn't separate it from the rest. Climate journal, climate knowledge should be essential in every journalist um, life. So we, we see, we've seen during the pandemic how um, every journalist was expected to know every all the essentials of COVID-19 um, um, disease because you can't report on it wrong. So why is this not the case for climate change? And I, I think every journalist should have at least the basics of climate change and climate science correct because it is going to impact any sector you write about. If you write about sports, if you write about business, if you write about politics, it really all links to climate change. So the way to integrate it is by actually making sure that the journalists and the editors know how to integrate climate change in those different aspects. And then again, also understand how you can translate it to a general public. Right now, um, the COP26 um, conference has started in Glasgow two days ago. Everyone is talking about it. If you go and try uh, and read um, Arabic media new, uh, news reporting on it, it's quite shallow. We're, all, we're only reporting on the fact that there are presidents, the world leaders are given statements, but no one is actually reporting on what this means for the Arab region. I mean, it really is the journalist's um, job to actually convey this information and make the general public and the MENA region understand what's on stake for them and why this conference matters. Um, and I think the only, the only reason journalists are not doing so is just because journalists themselves are really scared of climate change and climate policies. They think it's very complicated. And that's what we need to focus on. And we really need to do this because I think climate awareness in the MENA region is quite low among the general public, even though we are one of the main, um, uh, we are one of the regions that are on the front line when it comes to climate change. We've just seen um, the presentation that Lauren gave. So in order for us to bridge that gap, we really need to invest in media. And I think that's one of the areas that policymakers need to also think about. Yeah. Wow. I think I need to take one of your classes. <laughs> and I love the point about uh, COVID because it's true, you know, we were all scrambling to learn how to cover that really quickly and became experts overnight. Um, whereas climate change is equally, if not more pressing. Uh, I'm gonna stay with you for a second. Um, so COP26, we've seen a bunch of pledges. Uh, we've seen a lot of flashy numbers and press statements. Um, as a media practitioner, um, and I guess, you know, helping the public as well, how do we hold governments to account and ensure transparency when it comes to these big green pledges and projects? I'm sure there's a follow-up, you know? Yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've seen already, we're three days in, um, in COP26 and we're already seeing big pledges being made all over the country. Um, Saudi recently just uh, pledged that it will go net zero by 2050. We were seeing really big um, promises from governments in the region and globally. And I think journalists can, 
ensure transparency from these parties and can actually do better reporting by asking the right questions. So if you're a journalist who is covering climate change and you have access to policymakers in your country, um, regardless of where you are, you come from, you need to ask the right questions. Don't ask them to tell you about how good their pledge is because that's what their job is. Ask them how they're actually going to commit to it. Ask them if they have milestones, how are they actually going to measure this, um, the impact of their, of their pledges and what are their plans? Have they already started implementing it in, in, in on the ground? When are they planning to do so? I think as a journalist, you can ensure the transparency and you can actually hold those people accountable if you just do your research and if you actually end up asking the right questions. And again, journalists usually have access to those policymakers and you, sh you should seize that opportunity in order to also inform the public of what your policymakers are doing and if they're actually doing a, better, a good job because if your policymaker is not um, committing to the climate pledges, you need to think about this when, for the next elections. This is really important and these are all very connected. And, and like I said, again, journalism or media is the link between those two parties. No, I fully agree with what Lina just said. And the role of accountability is very important now. Um, there is, by the way, we've received a question in the chat about what is the role of, you know, greenwashing, meaning like making a facade, a decoration, making nice statements, but which are shallow. And I think this is the key issue that sometimes we have these big UN meetings, the COPs, where we have nice declarations, but behind, for instance, there is no follow up mechanisms. So when we talk about finance, in 2009 in Copenhagen, 100 billion per year was supposed to uh, be available by 2020 for developing countries to be able to adapt and mitigate also their uh, emissions, meaning reduce their emissions of these pollutants, these greenhouse gases, which generate climate change. Now, the problem is that you know, this was just ideas written on some paper at a distant uh, year so that the decision makers of that time were not accountable for what their successors would have to do. And the problem is that we see we're still not there, although 2020 ha has passed. So behind this anecdote, which is not a small one because we are talking about big money, we see that the mechanisms of accountability and especially in the Middle East, North African region, are very important to put in place. About that, I would like also to bounce back about what just um, Lina, but before that also Leah touched upon. We have some policies, sometimes which are implemented, sometimes they are partially implemented, but there are also milestones which are not very visible. So we don't know what is announced, what is completed, what is under progress. There is much better that needs to be done hear from the, of course, the government, which needs to have more transparency, and also from the community of journalists that need to go on the ground and see if projects are implemented. Finally, speaking about projects, I would like to say one thing. In the UN system, although there is not all the money that should be available, there is money available. And I should say one clear thing. As a former board member in one of these UN body providing money to developing countries, at the end of each fiscal year, I mean, of the UN system, we had the issue of a number of countries never claiming the money they had access to. And I should say, as a general rule, the states of the Arab region were doing very poorly. So I wouldn't like to name and shame, but we have some countries which are really developing countries, some of which have a electricity crisis happening every now and then, but they have never made any single request for uh, solar powered uh, power generation plants, for instance, to the Green Carbon Fund, right? So this is money available. And there is one Middle Eastern country I have in mind, which has regular uh, power blackouts and a huge issue with electricity generation has made just one request to this Green Carbon Fund and, or, um, and the, the GCF and if you compare it with, let's say, Kenya, which has a fairly similar level of development, Kenya has made 12 requests in recent years to this body. If we look at another source of funding, the CTCN, I was a board member of, this country has made one request, Kenya has made seven, just to compare the likes with the likes. So we have in the region a very important role to be played, 
both by uh, policy uh, facilitators and experts like Leah, but also from the side of the media to cover, because it's a shame that these days this money is available, but the governments are not focusing on tapping this money and having this materializing in climate solutions. So this is available and it should be more proactively being tapped for the development of the region. Wonderful, thank you, Lauren. And I'm gonna come back to you in a bit. I have a question for you. But Leah, I think you wanted to, to follow up on this. Just a quick, quick follow up on what uh, Lina and Lauren were saying about really the importance of, of climate change journalism. Um, because I think uh, a journalist can reach um, two important audiences. First, the government. The government only listens to journalists, only listen to press. This is something that I think they feed on, that they live on. And not, not, not from, from a bad angle. This can be used really to push policies. And because we have journalists that persevere and that ask the proper questions, as Lina says, said, this facilitates our job as, as yes. experts because you know they give us the alibi and they, they, they play our role. We are on the same team at the end of the day. And I think this is very, a very important role, especially in the MENA region, um, to, put, to, to put pressure on governments to keep on, especially that we change governments like we change stocks. So we need to keep the pressure on the consecutive governments so that they keep on carrying the plans of the previous and of their ancestors, or um, I mean, uh, of their predecessors, so that it doesn't die with if a minister leaves or if a minister comes. And second, I think climate change journalism is very important also for the public. And this is where we lack. Climate change in our region is still seen as a luxury issue that, you know, only develop, citizens of developed countries discuss, uh, you know, while sipping tea. This is not the case. People have to realize that what they are suffering from today is partly, partially due to climate change and that we can and we should do something about it. And we can and should push the governments to do something about it and not the opposite. You know, hello, we have our, our prime minister in Glasgow really trying, really trying to mobilize funding, really trying to put our plans there. And if you if you read the social media, you know, they are all making fun of, of, you know, of making climate change as a priority. This is not our priority. It's not the time for this. They are not seeing the link between climate change and economic growth, climate change and building resilience and food security and energy security. And this is where I should journalists have a key role to play. I agree, we do have a key role to play uh, in most issues. <laughs> no, that's important. Um, and I imagine that also, you know, a challenge to this is the scale of climate change issues where if someone says, you know, we're gonna go carbon neutral by 2150. Uh, not a lot of journalists are gonna wait around and do a follow-up story. Uh, but Lauren, I wanted to ask you, um, speaking of pledges, we've seen a bunch of pledges from Gulf countries uh, in the last month or two, uh, talking about going net zero by 2050 and carbon, uh, you know, capture and stuff like that. Um, can, can you talk to us a little bit about specifically in the Gulf, how do these big green initiatives and green projects, green cities, how do they typically turn out? Do, do we see them manifest in reality? So yes, now things have changed in recent years. In the Gulf states, you know, initially, you know, 15 years ago, there used to be a lot of climate denial in the Gulf states. Roughly 10 years ago, things started to change because they were seeing that there were issues. Again, sea level rise is one of the key issues because it's already affecting the cost. So, you know, decision makers decided to take it seriously. And, and the UAE and Qatar, for instance, took the lead um, in terms of being part of higher ambitions as groups or hosting the delegations for the climate negotiations in 2012, for instance, in Doha. So things started to change. And in recent years, and especially in recent weeks and months, we've seen some um, new approaches where uh, solar energy, especially, though not only, but renewables, most generally speaking, are supposed to become a uh, fair amount of the energy mix of each Gulf countries in the decades to come. Now, this is good. This goes alongside even better. There are some proposals in the national, uh, nationally determined contribution. So this is the official document each country sends to the UN roughly every five years as part of the Paris Agreement. 
In these documents, the Gulf states have announced, several of them at least, have announced that they will try to um, decrease their emissions. Let's keep in mind, in the Paris Agreement, developing countries, including the Gulf states, are not obliged to decrease their emissions, you know, because they are not historically responsible for it. <clears throat> but the Gulf states, in line with the spirit of the Paris Agreement, they are planning to decrease their emissions in the future. So we see a major progress in the span of 20 years from climate denial to actions. Now, is it going fast enough? I would, I would personally say, no, it's not yet fast enough. It's a major change. Yes, we take it, we're happy with it, but it can go even further. What is interesting, it's not necessarily part of these national communications, these NBCs, these reports to the UN, but it's the hydrogen strategies. So we see major moves, moves um, happening in the industry of energy. So the in energy industry, which used to be the main problem, oil and gas, is changing itself. So we'll see in the years to come what is greenwashing, again, just propaganda, but it seems, and we have already witnessed some huge investments in the field of solar energy and so on. So I give you one example, Saudi Aramco is investing in something else than oil and gas, which used not to be the case, I mean, except petrochemicals. And in Qatar, what used to be called Qatar Petroleum now is called Qatar Energy. Why? Because they want to expand their activities and not to stay stuck in the hydrocarbons, which they fairly understand is not the future of energy. So we see a series of changes. We can be optimistic that the momentum is increasing. We just need to be fast enough, you know, because we live in a climate emergency. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Lena, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you, um, you know, capitalize on this um, sort of optimism we've got going with Lawrence. Um, you know, when we talk about climate change reporting and talking about climate change, uh, it's easy to be quite pessimistic and the scale of the problem seems overwhelming at times. Um, so, so as a journalist, how do you sort of balance between these great existential weighty problems um, and injecting some optimism into the debate, um, pre, you know, presenting sort of the existence of constructive solutions when we're talking about uh, climate change. I think that's actually a very um, important question. Um, climate change is often used by mainstream media to um, get clickbait articles. Like you would see a title saying, now uh, we have two weeks to fix climate change or we will all die. And they were basically referring to COP26, but they decided to frame it that way. And that, that is the type of articles you as an individual would avoid because no one wants to read sad, depressing news anymore. We had a year of COVID, more than a year now of COVID and lockdowns, and our anxiety is over the roof already. So people automatically and by default try to avoid um, depressing news. And I think that's, again, where we uh, media might be falling in some areas. Um, when it comes to climate change, I think we are over the point where we need to convince someone that climate change exists because the science is very clear. Climate denialism is not an issue as it used to be anymore. The issue is now what to do about it. And I think any journalist should try and keep in mind the audience that will be reading this article, watching this piece. Who are you speaking to? If you actually understand your audience very well, you will know how to speak to them. You need to offer a solution. I'm, I'm a huge fan of solution-driven um, journalism because I'm a, as a reader, if I read about um, climate change and how it's going to impact my country and you don't offer me any solution, what am I supposed to do with this article? Be stressed? I already am. So what can we do is we can offer the reader and um, we can offer them solutions. Like what can you do on an individual level? What can, you, what can we do on a policy and a national level? And again, part, when we talk about policies, any individual has a, um, has a has a role in this because you can pressure your government and leah said if when the media is able to speak to governments because we show them what the public thinks about them if they talk if they talk about climate change and one of my favorite quotes is that um, a politician's uh, nightmare is losing election so if you lose the public's um, um the public's um view of you that's, that's the most important thing. So if the public is now advocating for climate action and advocating for environment friendly policies, that's what the politicians will do because they don't want to lose elections. They want to continue in power. And that's the way to get to them. So I think trying to balance between 
how frustrating and how concerning climate change is, and also just offering the reader a solution on what they can do uh, on an individual level, on a national level, but also just offering them the bigger picture, like what did we actually come out of this COP? How do we measure this success? I think it's not that hard of a job and any journalist um, should be able to do it. Thank you, Lena. Uh, just to remind everybody uh, watching, if you have a question, click the Q&A button and type it up and, and we'll answer that question. Uh, Leah, I want to talk to you, speaking of doom and gloom, uh, there is plenty of that in Lebanon, um, but looking towards the future, um, you know, we need to have a, we need to talk about recovery and the way that Lebanon is going to get back on its feet. Uh, you talked earlier about centering climate change and sustainability in our discussions of any sort of project, whether it be infrastructural or, um, you know, a, a, a ministerial policy. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how a climate centric um, recovery might look like, you know, in somewhere like Lebanon? Actually, I wouldn't call it maybe climate centric, but maybe sustainable centric. Um, climate centric, I think it's um, um, it's too ambitious, too good to be true, and maybe um, uh, more um, uh, more focused. Uh, when we really talk about, you know, um, after these uh, these uh, these compounded crises. Um, the international community in Lebanon sit together and and uh, uh, um, develop this three R framework um, framework for the recovery, rebuild, and reform of Lebanon. And this three R framework that is supposed to really guide um, all development plans um, um, in Lebanon has sustainability and resilience at the core. Of it. And when we talk about sustainability and resilience, automatically we talk about climate change. So. Um, um, uh, all, all the plans that have been put out there and that were endorsed actually by the previous government and by this government is to green back better, uh, build back better, build back greener, integrate, because you know the decisions that we take today will, uh, will be locked for the future. And we are aware, you know, we've through experience, the decisions that we've taken in 2009, we're still paying their price today. So I think the public and the government are very aware that locking uh, smart and sustainable decisions today will be uh, um, will drive an, an economic growth, a green recovery, a green reform down um, um, a clear path. And this is something that the international community is asking from Lebanon. And this is an additional pressure. And I think this is a positive pressure that we cannot repeat the same mistakes we need to think differently and we need to think to really put things, for example, um, um, when, when we talk about planning and implementing projects, we cannot not take into consideration disaster risk reduction and increasing resilience of infrastructure. So, I mean, the main development projects of infrastructure in a way to, um, um, to really reduce the recovery to future shocks. The same for renewable energy. Um, I think it, this was really the silver lining of the crisis. If you see the market of renewable energy in Lebanon, especially the decentralized um, renewable energy, it has skyrocketed. Even studies say that the market grew three times. All companies in Lebanon are out of stock for small decentralized solar, um, solar power units. So this really has created that uh, it has deployed a big market based on needs because such changes will never happen if it doesn't come from a need. And unfortunately, um, we've hit rock bottom. I hope <laughs> that we've hit rock bottom, but you know, as they always say, the only way is up and, um, and the only way is to do, it, to do it better and to do it in a sustainable and a green way. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna um, push you and, and sorry, Lauren. Uh, push you a little bit on this, Leah, because in Lebanon, um, you know, planning is one thing and then implementing is another. Um, so I kind of want to ask you about how contexts where you have a weak state impact um, sustainability and sustainable projects, because something that comes to mind in Lebanon specifically is, let's say, um, you know, the, the lack of a, of a functioning power grid in Lebanon has led to um, the reliance on generators. And there's a lot of reports coming out now about the impact on air quality and pollution coming from these generators. Um, so maybe could, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what happens when you might have these plans that are ambitious, but not necessarily a state capable of ensuring they're implemented? 
yes, you move more, and this is, I think, the direction the country is um, taking. You move into decentralized implementation. You move into more um, working on in an enabling environment to let the market and the private sector flourish and um, implement where the government is failing to make a decision. And renewable energy, again, is one of, I think, uh, the most important examples going today. So as a government, as an international um, community, for example, UNDP, we work hard to create incentives to remove, let's say, to push for the re removal of uh, fossil fuel subsidies, so that automatically, you know, by, by doing small, uh, small uh, uh, regulatory um, steps, automatically you, you unleash a whole market, just the fact that we, that fossil fuel subsidies have been removed. Just this, this created, it, it, it made things feasible. It made investment uh, more, uh, it, it makes sense to invest in renewable energy, to invest in, in a hybrid car, um, um, to carpool, it just now makes sense. And I think this is where the international community and international organizations that are more and more taking um, 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 decisions in Lebanon, they have to really work on these institutional arrangements, on this enabling environment, so that you, you, you're not crippled, um, or progress or sustainability is not just um, imprisoned or uh, held hostage with the government, but it can move forward with civil society, with municipalities, and with NGOs. And I think, I think personally that this is the direction that the country is taking for the next 10 years and that the achievements will be done by, uh, from a decentralized manner rather than from a central government. I agree with uh, Leah. I just wanted to add uh, two things. First, surprisingly, uh, the country which has managed to have the fastest energy transition in the MENA region is Yemen. And the reason is very simple. The war in Yemen has destroyed the electricity network in so many places, but there has been this very rapid solar revolution. Now, and this is where, unfortunately, the story is not unfolding so well. Um, already the war is a catastrophe and there is a humanitarian crisis on a scale largely uh, unseen before. But in addition, where it does not necessarily is so green is that yes, there was power generation coming from the private sector, some NGOs playing a role, et cetera, in decentralized organization. But, and especially I say it for a country like Lebanon, the key problem they are facing in Yemen and they've been facing for a few years, and Lebanon should be careful about that, is the problem of the batteries. Because when you have solar panels in a decentralized system, you will need batteries because of course, otherwise at night you have no electricity at all. And the problem is that batteries, especially where you have very hot summers, don't last so long. And the problem um, my team and I uh, have been studying over the past year and a half is that in Yemen, because there is no recycling of the batteries, we have an environmental catastrophe in the pipeline, which will explode one day because we have the batteries which are thrown away and it goes, finds its way to the wadis and then to the water places, and then it will eventually go and pollute the underground water resources with very long time contaminants. So I agree with Leah that there is a very big role to be played by the market, by NGOs, by other non-state organizations, it can be charities, it can be also regional organizations and the UN system. But I have to say that it's very important that, again, we ask the government to intervene, especially so that with regards to the treatment of waste and especially these kind of long term pollutants like make mercury and so on coming from the batteries, that there is a system in place. We want solar energy to be part of the solution, not to be generating another catastrophe in the pipeline. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'm going to take a question from the audience here. Um, and I'm going to kick it to Lena. but. Feel free to answer anybody else. Um, talking about historical responsibility for um, climate change, um, given that the West is, you know, the main contributor to climate change historically, is there room for discussion about the West um, helping the MENA more um, in terms of um, addressing their own um, climate change issues and sustainability plans? 
Absolutely. And I think actually that's the essence of the COP conference. Um, that's, um, that's where the UNFCCC, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change came from, because um, historically speaking, if you put all of the Arab region um, at, in one group, they contributed less than half a half point point oh percent of the global emissions so technically we didn't cause this issue why do we have to compensate our economic development for it that's the main argument and this is why we see that developed countries the west is generally the ones that are are starting to cut down on their emissions they are starting to make the pledges but then again we realize that climate change is happening so fast to the point that it cannot be done by one side of the world and it needs everyone to contribute and we have this concept in the negotiations uh, in the climate negotiations called common but differentiated responsibilities so which essentially means that everyone has contributed differently to climate change but we all have to do something and that translates into the national determined contributions that every country has to submit because you decide what you can do within your own capacity and then again developing countries like all of the Arab region get to ask for support and Lawrence uh, said unfortunately is that there is support available but we're just not making use of it Sudan has only got their first um, approved DCF um, project two years ago. That was the first approved DCF project. If you go and look at other neighboring African countries, that the, there are either they got twelve or fifteen uh, projects approved in the past. So, my I think the problem is that we're just not making good use of the available opportunities. And I can actually link this again to what is happening in Sudan at the moment. So in the, at the moment, I think everyone here has heard of um, situation in Sudan. There's a military coup. Uh, the transitional government has been detained and um, uh, it's not looking good. And this is going to, this political instability is going to cause a lot of mess when it comes to environmental policies because we have people who have started working on plants and then they are no longer in power. We have a military that doesn't care about climate change or anything else in that, in that matter, actually. And so who's going to work on this? We're going to have another government and then we're going to have another coup and then we're going to have another government. This, it, this mess is what is causing us to not make take advantage of what's available out there. Question from the audience, which I think is important because we've talked a lot about media's role in bridging the gap between uh, science and policy um to the public um and someone asked a question which kind of challenges that um how much sway would the public realistically have in MENA countries where electoral voting is not always um does not always uh, have a relevance on, or direct impact on who's in power um so leah if you want to go ahead and respond uh, quickly to lena's point just a quick um a quick uh, um um, follow up on what uh, Lauren and Lina were saying about accessing funds. We have to be careful that a lot of these funds are not easy to access, especially the Green Climate Fund. And uh, those of you guys who have even tried to develop a project, a transformative project to the Green Climate Fund, know what we're really talking about. A lot of money has to be in invested uh, uh, um, upstream to prepare all these studies for a project to be accepted or not. This is one. Two, a lot of these projects um, rely on loans. It's subsidized loans, but it's loans. And a lot of our countries are trying to cut on loans. And when you talk about grants, usually grants are a couple of billion and they are, um, um, they are a lot invested in capacity building and technical transport and not really transformative project and infrastructural projects that we need at the end of the day. We can do, uh, uh, we, we can do uh, to a limit in terms of capacity building, but what we need is really big changes. So just don't be lured by the amount of money that is available uh, out there. And um, um, it's not like, you know, you just uh, present a project and you get funding. There's a lot of work. Lebanon has been trying for five years now to get one GCF project. We are having a lot of other bilateral projects with the EU, with a lot of other um, um, easier procedures. It's, it's really a procedure. Um, but with big multilateral funds like the GCF, um, um, yeah, don't be lured about, you know, these big amount of money that they put on the table and that they sell to developing countries. Yeah. So just to make this clear. But I, I fully agree, Leah. It's not easy. And actually, I have helped several countries in the Sahel region, so which are institutionally much weaker 
than countries of the MENA region. So for instance, Mali, Niger, or Guinea. And these countries have managed because they have looked to start with capacity building to then, to then move on to other streams. I give you an example. In the UN funding system, there are easy, low hanging fruits, which do not provide so much money, yes, but which enable you to develop a team which has the skills to make bankable projects, including for the GCF. By the way, when you go to the CTCN, so again, one UN body, then, and they vet your projects for capacity building, then you're fast-tracked for money in the GCF. This has come from an agreement, and I was a board member, so I know about it, because we had to approve that, and this is now functioning. So I would say, yes, it's not easy, but so that it becomes transformative in the years to come. This is an investment to be made. And I finish with a very short story, which is very important. China understood 15 years ago that there was money to be made out of the Kyoto Protocol and the clean development mechanism, basically the money coming from the Kyoto Protocol. It built a team. This team worked tirelessly in getting hundreds and hundreds of millions from the clean development mechanism towards China. So much so that within 10 years, China had become the largest recipient and by far of the clean development mechanism. And in 10 years, China shifted from an importing country of solar panels to the world's largest manufacturer of solar panels. I'm not saying this is the kind of thing a country like Lebanon or Morocco can do, but I'm saying if there is a lesson to be learned from that is that there is a bunch of countries including China, including also increasingly India, but Kenya and a few other countries, which have understood that this is a strategic investment to be made and it can become transformative if we have a mid to long-term roadmap and that we start with the capacity building, developing these skills so that you have a team in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where normally the people should be to access to this funding so that gradually over the years they bring streams of income from the different organizations that have funding available. Again, there are so many funds, adaptation fund, also the, the Jeff and so many others that this is a strategic investment. I finish, my students and I, we made some calculations. One Chinese, one Chinese civil servant as part of the team of China making this funding brings per year in average more than $10 million. This is very, very, you know, this is a big profit because even if he's a highly paid civil servant in China, he will never make more than a million dollars, not even 10% not even of that. So the, the investment is worth it. If you guys would like to make closing comments, um, you know, go ahead. Lena, if you have anything to say, just to close up. I uh, just want to thank um, Laurent and Leah for honestly this, this insightful conversation. I think uh, if there's a lesson to be learned here is that uh, climate change is, is a threat, but it's also an opportunity. And this is what we need to look at now. We need to change the perspective and we need to uh, integrate this in our policies, in our future plans, in our media, and even our daily life conversations. So I think we just need to change the perspective. And I really, um, I really hope the best for the region. The region has been suffering enough and we really need to start making a positive change. So yeah, thank you again for this invitation. Thanks, Lena. Leah? Yes. Um, also, thanks for uh, you know for having uh, um, um, for having the opportunity to talk about climate change for uh, 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 for an Arab audience. Um, I think we should be doing this more. We should uh, demystify climate change, make it a more accessible term, uh, simplify it to uh, to the Arab public, because um, I think we still lack on this, and we really need it to push policies, to push policymakers, and to trigger this behavioral change because it all starts from the individual, you know, just like we learned at school. And I think this is something that we all have to work on for the generations to come. Wonderful, thank you. Laurent, did you wanna? Fully agreed with what my two predecessors said really well. So there's not much to, to add and, and the challenge is huge, you know, uh, both for the press and for the government, especially. Um, but um, we should really work on it. And I think, and maybe we should finish on that. Climate change is a major issue, but let's try to see it also as an opportunity for a transformative form of development, a greener development and a development which can be more integrative 
of the whole society. So this is what I can only hope for. And we're, I think all of us really aware about it and working on it. So let's be optimistic about that. Thank you all. This is a super fascinating conversation that you all brought um, different, but you know, really unique insights into this. Uh, I think this was kind of a sobering talk because it really showed the, the scale of climate change and the challenge ahead, but I'm not leaving as depressed as I expected. Um, so that's good. It's hopeful. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you a lot. And I promised uh, our podcast team, I mentioned that on Friday, we have a podcast coming out about this topic about climate change in the Middle East. So uh, tune into the new Arab voice on Spotify to listen to that. Besides that though, Thank you everyone for joining us, three wonderful panelists and everybody participated. Thanks a lot and have a great night.